When I was a child, in our house, there was not much use in watching television because someone was bound to call or burst through the front door to tell some big tale that they couldn't keep to themselves. In our home, the only show that was watched regularly was the aforementioned The Logans. Mostly because everyone in our community was watching it too, so we knew we wouldn't be interrupted. <laughs> Mostly, we listened to stories in our living room or on the front porch. My parents and aunts and uncles and cousins and neighbors and everyone in between talked all the time. My granny Mae told tales while she hoed the corn and beans or while she sat in her broom rocking chair and swatted flies without missing a beat. My father talked from underneath the hood of the car, emerging with black and greasy arms long enough to grab a wrench, take a drink from his Pepsi, then went back under to fix the alternator while simultaneously finishing the story. All my good uncles, Bobby, Lonnie, Red, Ray, Sam, Jack, standing in a row, laughing about their honky-tonk days. My preacher uncles, James and Walter, talking low and serious about church or scriptures, which is all they ever talked about. They claim to have never had any honky-tonk days, although we all knew they had. My girl cousins, Dina, Tina, and Tina, sitting on the creek bank with their feet in the rushing waters of Laurel Fork, confided in one another. Melanie and Barb, my cousins who hardly ever took a breath while they related some epic that had happened that day at school. Everything was an epic to Melanie and Barb. My best friend Donna, making up things as she went, adding in twists and turns whenever the notion struck her. My uncle Dave, reciting poems, singing little made-up songs, slapping his knee while he threw back his head to laugh. My aunts and mother in the kitchen washing dishes, stories curving in and out and over top of one another, all of them somehow making sense at the same time. Then a good song would come on the radio and my mother and sister would dance a little and sing a lot at the kitchen sink and collapse into laughter and another story and I would love them so much that I couldn't stand it. For the juicier stories, I would disappear into the shadowy corners of the living room, crawl up under the high front porch, hunker, hunker beneath the supper table, sit beneath the quivering branches of the snowball bush in the front yard, anything to eavesdrop. I was a glutton for secrets. I devoured words, sentences, stories. In case you haven't noticed by my accent, I'm Appalachian. So because of being Appalachian, because of this accent, we knew early on that language was political, that stories were even more important to us, the members of a seemingly vanishing culture, that words could be used to preserve and fight back. On the rare occasion when we left the region and people made fun of the way we talked, we knew how to fight back, by either telling them off or using our mouth charm to disarm them. One instance of my childhood I'll never forget is when a substitute teacher from off, as we call it, though from off we'd say, this is anywhere other than that. <laughs> anyway, this teacher was from somewhere away, and I said something in class, and she leaned over my desk and told me that I had to get rid of that hillbilly accent if I wanted to ever become anything. She wasn't being mean. She thought that she was being helpful. No matter that I had perfect grammar and spelling, my accent sounded like poverty, and so it would not suffice. I wanted to ask her why no one ever made the Kennedys change their accents, which certainly sounded thicker than mine to me. I knew, even then, that the reason was because that accent sounded like money. But there were good teachers, too. When I was in seventh grade, my favorite teacher, Miss Sandra Stidham, wrote a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt on the blackboard. No one can make you feel inferior without your own consent. I had already been taught some form of this notion by my family, but seeing it spelled out in Miss Stidham's neat, hunchbacked cursive on the blackboard, seeing it written down in words solidified it for me. Since I wanted to be a writer, since my idols were John Boy Walton and Harper Lee, in a time when all the other little boys idolized Evil Knievel and Larry Bird, I knew the negative power of words too. <clears throat> While the other boys 
played football, I lay against a tree and read The Outsiders. While they followed their father's leads to be racist, even though they didn't know anyone who wasn't just like them, I wept while I read The Mockingbird and realized that there were lots of different people in the world. Books saved me over and over. Books and music and poetry, and I wasn't ashamed of it. I became a young artist who announced himself as such in class. At 12 years old, I began to identify as a writer. This didn't go over well with those snarling boys and a few of the more scoffing girls, so they called me names. Since I was scrawny and they were all gigantic, or at least it seemed to me at the time they were, I could only fight back so much before they pummeled me. So I fought back in my little black and white composition book. In my notebook, I could write anything I wanted to about them, and my anger would sizzle down my arm and at the tips of my fingers like light. The frustration becoming sentences that became paragraphs, that became scenes, and then I had created something. And the act of creation is a powerful thing. I began to write as if my life depended on it, and I never stopped. The first time I went to a community meeting about mountaintop removal, I thought a whole lot about the way stories and words had saved me. I thought about the importance of preservation in its many forms, whether it be by sitting around an elder listening to a story, or writing the story down in a notebook, or tapping a novel out into a laptop. I thought about the way that the place I love the most, Appalachia, exists in books more permanently than it now exists on earth, now that men have managed to build machines that are able to do what was once unthinkable, remove mountain. I realize that most of you already know what mountain talk removal is, so I'll only spend a minute or two defining that for the benefit of anyone who doesn't. The term is concise and straightforward. Mountain talk removal is a radical form of surface mining an entire mountain is blown up for a relatively thin seam of coal. This destructive method requires large areas for disposal of the resulting overburden or waste. Topsoil, dirt, rocks, trees. The trees are almost never harvested so that coal can be extracted as quickly as possible. All of this is then pushed into the valleys below, buried in the streams, trees, animals. This activity is neatly described as valley fields. Although the mining industry's loudest defense is that mountain people need the jobs that mining supplies, the truth is that mining jobs are being buried along with overburden. Mountain top removal is done by giant machines. Drag lines, bulldozers, and dynamite don't require as large a number of employees as deep mining does. According to USA Today, this mechanization has resulted in a net loss of about 50,000 jobs in West Virginia alone over the last 30 years. It's also important to point out here that the counties that produce the most coal in Appalachia are usually the poorest. Take, for example, Pike County, Kentucky, Kentucky's biggest coal producer, which has trademarked itself as, quote, America's energy According to the 2000 census, the median income for a household in the county was about $23,000 as compared to $50,000, the national average. The county produces 35 million tons of coal a year. In 2000, the average price of coal per short time was $16.78. That means that coal production in Pike County equaled about $6 billion in the same year that the median income for a family in that county earned less than 50% of the national average. Something's not adding up in that equation. The EPA estimates that about 2,000 miles of streams have been buried by valley fields. About 500 mountains are gone forever. More than 1.5 million acres of land gone. Mountaintop removal causes air, water, and noise pollution contributes to flooding, destroys aquifers, wells, cracks foundations, much, much more. But even worse than destroying the trees and water and all life that lies in its wake, the most important thing that I want to tell you about today 
is that mountaintop removal is killing our stories too. It's obliterated way of life. That first day I went up on mountaintop removal side was six years ago. I had been invited by my friend Wendell Berry, the environmentalist, writer, humanitarian, prophet. We spent that day touring mountaintop removal sites, visiting healthy mountains for comparison, doing flyovers that gave us a bird's eye view of the massive devastation that stretched for miles. When people climbed out of the little four-seater airplanes, they were still weeping from what they had seen. We rode in a van away from the airport, silent except for an occasional sniffing. We were a dozen riders gathered together in one little van, but there were no words between us. There were no words to properly convey what we had just witnessed, looking down on a moonscape on acres of death. But despite the power of seeing all those things, nothing compared to the words we heard left that night. The grassroots organizers of the event put all of us riders at two long tables in the front of the room, and people came for us and gave their testimonies one at a time. They talked. We sat silent, stunned. The grief and frustration spread out and covered us all like coal dust. There were so many stories of victimization, of the company's greed and lack of respect. So many stories of children being bathed in poisoned water, or children playing in creeks that were suddenly surrounded by dozens of dead fish, or old men who had worked all of their lives only to settle in their holler and find the mountaintop removal site spread out next to them. There was one woman in particular. She held an eight by 10 photograph of her dead 18-year-old daughter, killed by overloaded coal trucks, trying to keep up with the heavy production of the Mount Tocumoga sites. I'll never forget her liver-spotted, blue-veined, hard-working hands holding onto the picture frame as if clinging to life. I'll never forget what she said at the end of her testimony. It changed me forever. Nobody would listen to us, she said. You all have to tell our story. Seeing the scene from the airplane had been hard. Standing over a mountaintop from the side had been moving. But again, nothing hit us with as much weight as those testimonies. When people are abandoned by the representatives, they always turn first to the artist in their communities. I believe that an artist has a responsibility to give voice to the voices, to take something that might seem as if it could not be articulated and articulated. That night, we knew that we had been past this responsibility. And so we did what writers do. We set to collecting stories and writing and sharing our words. All of my grief and concern manifested itself in a book I co-wrote with Jason Howard called Something's Rising, Appalachian's Fighting Mountain Top Removal. In this book, we collected the oral histories of 13 normal, everyday people, not organizers or radicals or politicians, all people who were fighting against mountaintop removal in a variety of quiet yet effective ways, mostly by telling their stories to anyone who would listen. In Something's Rising, we hope to give voice to their lives, culture, and to the determination of people whom the co-companies have been trying to systematically remove for more than 100 years. We wanted to give the power back to the people by allowing them to tell their own stories in their own words, thus a collection of oral histories. We preceded each of these oral histories with a long magazine-style feature to introduce the reader to the physicality, voice, and life story of the person giving the oral history. In effect, we wanted to make sure that each teller was a complete human being to the reader before hearing the world history, which would then expand on their humanity. We wanted to shed light on the fact that environmental industries don't just destroy trees, mountains, and rivers, but also destroy the stories of the people, and by extension, an entire way of life. In collecting the stories of the people, I felt that I was also helping to preserve the stories of my own family and my own story. My grandfather, Johnny Shepard, worked for more than 30 years in the Leslie County, Kentucky coal mines. After 10 years in, he lost his leg during a roof collapse.
collapse. He was conscious the entire time until he was knocked out by doctors for the amputation. He spent a fidgeting six months recuperating and then insisted on going right back into the mines that had claimed to work him. That's how much he loved being a coal miner. Up until his dying day, he spoke of his fellow miners as if they were his blood brothers. My maternal uncle, Sam Hoskins, still wears a coal tattoo that he was marked with when a rock fell from a mine ceiling, leaving a three-inch gash across his right cheekbone. A coal tattoo happens anytime coal breaks the skin, leaving behind its residue that appears greenish blue around the healed scar. I was always fascinated by this mark of survival. I grew up around men who couldn't wash the coal dust out from around their eyelashes so that they looked as if they were always wearing eyeliner. Men who came in from work with only the whites of their eyes and their teeth shining, who sat and told big, exaggerated, wonderful stories about the coal mining life while they took supper. There's plenty of coal mining pride in my family, but there's another side of living within an environmental-based economy. I grew up with an active strip mine as a neighbor. My childhood was marked by the blast, the dust, the constant groan of machinery, the monotonous shifting of gears as coal trucks raced up and down the road carrying out their spoils. This hillside was flattened and everything on it was gone. This was a place where I had watched lightning bugs rise up in the summer twilights, where my father and I had gathered walnuts in the fall, where my best friend and I had gone sled and had hung crawdads in the mossy banked creek. Suddenly, it was blasted off the face of the earth. The mining company pulled out after a shoddy reclamation, and the land has still not recovered. Thirty years later, unable to support hardwood trees, not much more than the sawgrass grows there now. Around the same time, my father's family home place at Happy Holler, Kentucky, was mined, erasing our heritage and causing my aunt's grave to be pushed over into the creek and buried some 50 feet below piles of unwanted topsoil, clay, and low-grade coal, coal burden. One of my earliest memories is of standing on a ridge overlooking the place that had once been the family burial ground, while my father and my uncles stood nearby, silent, except for the coins they rattled in their pockets. And, as I've told you before, they were never ever silent. Bobby, Lonnie, Red, Ray, Sam, Jack, James, Walter, they were never not telling stories. My family bore witness to the way coal mining can lay waste to the land. So, by that first time that I saw Mount Top Moogle, which is so much worse than any other form of mining, I already knew about the love-hate relationship many people feel about coal mining. I had not only seen it, I had lived it. The more I found out about Mount Top Moogle, the more I realized there was no love in the equation. After carefully examining the issue, and learning as much as I could, I knew that it was wrong. And even more than that, I knew that I had to do something better. So, my riding was my way of fighting back. Riding had always been my way of fighting back. It's a way of preservation. And that's what I've always tried to do in my novels. By riding, I fight for my place. By telling stories, I fight for my place. And by listening to stories, I fight for my place. There are all kinds of quiet little acts of activism that we can do every single day of our lives. We can change the world not just by carrying banners and chanting in front of the EPA. We can also make change by listening to each other, by loving words, by respecting language. This is one thing that those at the Southern Environmental Law Center do too, of course. While working on something's rising, I visited dozens of Mount Top Mule sites. I was welcomed into the homes of people who told me their stories of living near these sites. I was forever changed by the stories, images, people, places that we encountered. I've seen communities devastated by this practice, abandoned by their representatives and their neighbors. I've met people whose faces bore the grief that they've endured. Grief for not only a lost mountain, but their lost way of life. I've encountered evidence that caused me to question 
in my own government and to shake my head and wonder at how greed can distort and alter the landscape of a people and the integrity of an entire nation. But I've been changed for the positive too. Working on this issue has made me seek out my own way to be a better part of the solution. I'm convinced that leaving a simpler lifestyle is the best way to go not only for the environment but also for the soul. The people I've met and the stories I've heard have caused me to agree more than ever that standing up for what you believe in makes you and your country stronger. Despite this harebrained notion that some of the celebrity politicos who will go unnamed uh, like to spread around that protesting is unpatriotic. Nothing is more patriotic than protesting so long as you're educating yourself about what you're saying. I was changed by listening to the stories of the people, and I'm haunted by their stories. I'll carry them with me, and I won't let them go unheard. I'll share a couple with you. Erica and Ruli Urias live on Island Creek in Pike County, Kentucky, on a patch of land that the Urias family has occupied since the Revolutionary War. This is Erica Urias talking. There is no aspect of our lives that coal mine has not affected in some negative way. We used to live in a beautiful place. When you go down the road, it was like driving through a tunnel made of trees. Now it's sad and ugly. All the trees have been cut down along the roads so the coal company can move in. That was just the beginning. The road has now gotten so bad from the company's use that school buses can't run up the gravel road to our community. And we hope that no one here needs an ambulance. We either eat the dust from the coal trucks or hope we don't get bogged down in the muck on wet days. The mudslides constantly. The blast that the company uses to blow the mountain also shake our house. I was told recently that every week in Appalachia, the companies use the same amount of explosives that were used at Hiroshima. It can be strong enough to knock pictures off the wall and stuff off the shelves. One night about 8 o'clock, the blast was so bad that it took us 20 minutes to calm down our two-year-old dog in Arcadia. The water from our well has been ruined. We can't drink it, and now we're even afraid to get Michaela a bath. She loves to bath, and like most children will try to drink the water. We can't let her play with any toys that she can put water into and drink from because of the contamination. We bought her a kitty swimming pool last summer and filled it up, but the water looked like sweet tea. Our daughter cannot even enjoy her own backyard. All the wild mountains that make this place so beautiful are disappearing so that the companies can get out the coal as cheaply as possible. They blast the tops off and push it over into the valleys. We're sure the companies just want us to go away, but we're not going to. Our family's been here for generations and we're staying. We won't be run out. We won't back down. But we wonder what kind of future Michaela's going to have. Later, after this testimony, a few years later, it was a, a, a professional water test and the company was brought in. And they found that the Urias well contained arsenic levels that were 130 times in excess of what the EPA deemed safe. And they had been forced to bathe their daughter in. They've had to dig four wells, all at their own expense of about $4,000 per well. Most of the Urias' neighbors have sold out, tired of living in a war zone, but the Urias plan refuses, citing a visceral connection to the land where their great grandparents lived and died. One summer day, the Urias family took me and a few others up to the family graveyard where many of those grandparents were buried. They had prepared us an amazing lunch, pinto beans, cornbread, slaw, coconut pie, sweet tea, and we ate on quilts near the graves, a collection of brand new tombstones and 200-year-old rock markers. From this vantage point, we could see the lush mountain they had managed to preserve, but on every side of us, we could hear the roar of the dozers. As we ate, the ground shook and smoke curled over the next ridge. As we ate, they told their stories. One more. Beth May has lived her whole life on Wilson Creek in Floyd County, Kentucky, except for the eight years she went away to get her college degrees. As soon as she received her medical degree, she returned to Eastern Kentucky, where she serves as a nurse practitioner at a free clinic. 
She worked for 30 years to build herself a little home at the mouth of the harbor across from her elderly parents. About the time her house was completed, she received word that the entire ridge behind her property was about to be mountaintop removed. She quickly organized her community, and together they managed to stop the coal company through petition and public outcry. The first time a group of citizens has pulled off such a feat on its own without any kind of legal action. But Bev May knows that it's only a matter of time before another company is tempted by the rich veins that linger within the ancient mountain. Eventually, another company will want to get at that coal in the quickest, most inexpensive way of the company, the mountaintop removal. So this is Bev May talking. This is my home. I just put everything I've saved in my entire life into this house. I'm here because I want to be here. I could work anywhere I really could. When you're a nurse, you've got your ticket. But my family's here, my whole life's here. It's not an accident that I play old time music on the fiddle, or that I have chairs in my house that have had their bottoms caned by somebody down the road, or cabinets that were made by a local man. I live here, and I value that. And I love being in these mountains. This is home in the all-inclusive sense, and I will not be run off. I know for an absolute fact they will never mind my place, because they have to have my permission to do it, and they're never going to get that. So that I know, I know that for a fact, but I know they can make it so uncomfortable and unlivable that they can force people out when they start blasting your house and poisoning your dogs. It can get real ugly. I know that, I've seen it. But I also know they can't make me sell. I know that for sure, so that's certain, and they won't be able to make me. I just have no desire to live any place else. I want to be here because this is my life. There's just a lot of meaning to me in being here. I've got work that's meaningful and peaceful. I've got family nearby that look out for me and I look out for them. I've got a community. Where else in this whole country would I ever have that? I'd have to make it all over again, and it would never be equivalent. This is a blessing that I was given just by virtue of the fact of where I was born. I'm not going to toss that away. I'm certain in my heart that I am where I'm supposed to be. And doing exactly the work that I'm supposed to be doing, why would I let a coal operator change that? They cannot have my story. Bill May is one of my heroes, and one of the strongest and fiercest people I've ever known. So why doesn't the whole nation know the stories of Bev May and Erica and Ruby Urias? Why doesn't the whole nation know about the three-year-old boy from Appalachia, Virginia, who was crushed to death in his bed by a half-ton boulder dislodged from a mountaintop removal site at 2.30 in the morning when the company had ordered their dozer operator to work with inadequate lighting, cutting an illegal haul road, why does the whole nation know about the mudslides and floods that happen constantly? Why doesn't the whole nation know about the environmental genocide that is happening in this very state right at this minute? I don't know for sure, but I think a great big reason is because it's happening in a place of poverty. And poor people don't matter as much as others in our society. I mentioned harrowing politicians who are saying that speaking out against unjust laws is Patriotic. Though some politicians and talking heads are also saying that poor people are poor because they choose to be, because they're lazy, because they've given up. They fail to recognize the fact that when you are under the thumb, it is sometimes impossible to crawl your way out. They fail to recognize that when people are put down for years and years, they sometimes start to believe that they're worthless. Those talking heads don't understand that history matters that it shapes everything. I think there's a big connection between all those people who feel free to make fun of an accent like mine and the fact that environmental devastation on the scale of mountaintop removal is happening in the place where that accent was born and thrives. The rate at which mountains are being leveled increases every day. Dissenters are not asking that the coal industry be shut down they're simply asking for mining to be done with respect and responsibility, treating the place and her people with dignity. So far, the coal companies have refused to listen to that request. 
Government officials refuse to require them to do so, nor do our so-called leaders want to talk about alternative kinds of energy. So, as in so many other instances in history, our fate then lies within the hands of the law and the people. Thankfully, the law is sticking up for the people, and the people of Appalachia are rising up to make their voices heard. While the coal industry has bottomless pockets to hire the best PR firms, the people only have their words and their music. They are storytellers, stewards of the land. They know that one way to fight back is by telling your own story in your own words, by refusing to be silenced. And they refuse to be made to feel inferior. They are witnesses to a mind practice that is not only taking their place, but also tearing up their souls. In the process of talking about this form of environmental devastation, they have also revealed the way their own culture, their heritage, their very memories are being scraped away too. These voices are rising, building in strength. They are a murmur rising over the mountains, but soon they will become a roar that will slide along the hollers and shady creeks across ridge tops and cool cliff faces until they are heard by everyone. These are their stories and they are rising.